Okay, guys, <clears throat> we have a customer that's not going to last more than five minutes, this guy, Turge. I guess he doesn't know how we roll and how we play. Can you believe this guy has the audacity to ask me a question about Lot and his daughters and David committing adultery? Uh, Turge, you're going to answer my questions, and I'm going to answer yours. If not, I'm going to block you. Turge, are you listening? Because I just went early to deal with you to send you back to Mecca. Okay, are you ready? I want to shock you when I read to you from Tabari that they affirm the story of David committing adultery. But let's put that aside. You actually have a problem? Uh, be honest with me. I want to see how much of a man you are. You have a problem with David committing adultery, murdering someone, and then God punishing him. So you, you hate that, right? That's sin? Okay. That's sin, right? You agree. Adultery is sin, right? Durge, answer me directly. All right. We have another filthy dog, satanic dog here, bastard of the devil here. The demons are manifesting. I haven't even started. Okay, Turge, you're not answering my question. I'm going to block you. I'm going to block you. Don't answer my question. Well, it, you sure it's not fit? So does it fit for your prophet, Muhammad, to treat women like your mother, like whores, calling it muta? You're okay with Zawaj muta You wicked hypocrite, you son of the devil. Are you okay that your prophet did muta with women like your mother? Are you okay that he did that? So you're okay with Zawaj muta Muta was okay? You're okay with that? No, no, you're not answering my question. Did your prophet do muta? You wicked son of the devil, you liar. Did your prophet do muta? No, I didn't ask you. Okay, now, did your prophet do muta according to the Quran and the Hadith? Then you are a wicked liar, son of the devil, like your prophet. Surah Al-Nisa 24 and Surah Al-Maidah 87. What does Bukhari and the Mufassirin say about those ayat? What do they say? You wicked son of the devil, you liar. You're more disgusting than your prophet. Are you okay with your prophet taking women captive, raping them with their husbands still alive? Surat al-Nisa, ayah 24, and Sunan Abu Dawood, 2150. Do you want me to show you your prophet insulting people, cursing people and orphans? See, you are a wicked, filthy dog, worse than Muhammad, you ya kelb. Call me on Skype right now so I can humiliate you and your prophet. Let's see if you're more man than Aisha. Let's see if you're more man than Aisha. Call me. No, oh, it actually shows my character that unlike you, I hate Satan and his son, Muhammad. I hate Muhammad, a satanic bastard, makes dogs look clean. And you follow a dog, that means you're worse than a dog. Because Muhammad raped women like your mother. And he also prostituted women like your mother. And you're okay with it? Ya kelb. You are a son of Muta, like your prophet. You filthy dog. Hope you enjoyed it. See? Now that's how you treat these guys. Guys, you learn how to treat these Muslims now? Glory to Jesus Christ? Yeah, it's an insult to dogs. Right? You see how you treat these guys? Oh, I blocked the same wrong guy. But wasn't your prophet a prophet? Man, I, I blocked. Can someone unhide Tom? It was the wrong guy. Sorry about that, Tom. Guilt by association. Do you see how you treat these guys, folks? Do you see how you treat them? Anytime a Muslim, uh, Edward, you don't like it? Get the hell out of here. Go to hell. You're a dog too. You're scum. How about that? You like that now? Yay! <laughs> Glory to Jesus Christ. See? Guys didn't learn from the session with David Wood. You guys didn't learn from David Wood's session, right? I don't tolerate dogs, blasphemers, liars, sons of the devil, fake Christians who think they're spiritual and humble. This channel ain't for you. But anyway, for the rest of you, never waste your time. Guys, listen to me. Please, I want to teach you how to deal with these Mohammedan rats, these dogs who deserve no respect because they follow a filthy, whore, pedophile, rapist as the greatest moral example. Then they'll talk about David committing adultery and murder or Lot. 
as if they have a higher moral ground. Okay? Learn from my example. When they attack David, say, wait, wait. So when your prophet raped women like your mother, because if your mother was there, he would have raped her, even if your father's alive, or treat a woman like whores, calling it temporary marriage, you're okay with that filthy dog? Expose these filthy, wicked demons, these sons of the devil, for their hypocrisy. Glory to Jesus Christ. Don't be evangelic fishes. Don't be fake, humble, spiritual Christians. Don't think you're more Christian than Paul and the apostles and the prophets who are warriors and gave people a taste of their medicine. Glory to Jesus Christ, right? Please, don't pretend to be holier than thou. Sam, you're not being Christ-like. Your fake spiritual piety is why America and the West is in the spiritual condition that it is in today. All right? Anyway, with the rest of you, good to see you guys. Okay? Good to see you, those of you in sincere. Glory to Jesus Christ. They all have a Father, so Spirit. Yeah, let me repeat that again. I don't know if it sunk in. This fake piety, this fake Christian spirituality, evangelic fishes, sissified, effeminate sissies pretending to be men of God, is why America and the West is in the situation we find ourselves in. You know that, right? So don't, this channel ain't for you. I'm not going to kowtow to you guys. I'm not going to pretend to be a fake just to get your approval or your support. Take your support and you can, you know what you can do with it. May the Lord Jesus save me from unrighteous anger and from sinning against him. But may the Lord Jesus never allow me to compromise for fame or money. Please, Lord Jesus, in Jesus' name. Stinking sissies. They think they define Christianity with their sissified you know, effeminate Christianity. It's disgusting, man. Yeah, Tirat, this is not this is not for the faint of heart. Anyway, let's ask the Lord Jesus to bless us because I got a lot of articles. I have a lot of material to give you. You guys are looking for spiritual meat. I'm gonna give you spiritual meat and the session, God willing. By the grace of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. And articles filled with meat. I got a lot of articles to share with you. But guys, help me to help you. Right? Help me to help you. Don't let demons distract you. Don't engage them. Don't ask questions off topic. Please focus and help me to focus, not to stumble. And mods, when you see demons, if they say, here's the Skype number, call him and debate him. If not, muzzle them. Silence them so the Lord Jesus Christ will be glorified. So join me in prayer, please. Help me to help you. So we can glorify Christ together. I got a lot of articles for you guys. Okay? I got a lot of articles for you. So let me just pray, though. We love you, Father. We love you, Abba. We love you, Babi. We love you, Baba, the God and Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We love you, Son of God. We love you, Lord Jesus. The Father's heart become flesh, his eternal word, our God and Savior. We love you, Holy Spirit. We need you, Holy Spirit, the eternal spirit of the Father, the eternal spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, his Son. <clears throat> give us the grace to love you perfectly, to trust in you perfectly, destroy all our fears and doubts and unbelief. Holy Spirit, to cling to you and to cleave to you and guide this discussion. As you blessed the previous session with that young man, Holy Spirit, work in Iman, convict him to fall in love with the true Jesus, the Son of God, to accept the Lord Jesus as his Savior and Lord. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you bless this session by your strength, by your might. Save me from error stammering, confusion, and stuttering. Perfect my ability to recall the scriptures, interpret them correctly for the glory of Jesus, and bless the household of God. Illuminate them, Holy Spirit, and fill them, Holy Spirit. Teach us your word. Teach us your will. Teach us what the Bible says, and give us the grace to obey the word, to live out the word, to love the word, to proclaim the word without fear and compromise, and give us the grace, if necessary, to die for the word. Help us to plunge the depth of Scripture, Holy Spirit, and bring out the meat of Scripture and feast on the table of Scripture, the Word of God. Please, Holy Spirit, destroy attacks of Satan, distractions of the enemy, and cause us to become more like Jesus Christ, Lord, that he'll increase in us, in our loved ones, and my daughters that will be covered by the blood of Jesus. My daughters, our loved ones, covered by the blood of Jesus, sitting and thrown upon our hearts, the hearts of our loved ones, the hearts of my daughters. Please, Holy Spirit, save us from Satan from the world, from our own sinful passions, to never shame the Lord Jesus Christ. Please, Holy Spirit, 
fill my lungs and chest and throat and my, my heart with, with life and health to use it to glorify Christ and strengthen my voice and the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the servants who are gathered to hear from the Lord Jesus, not me, trusting you will work through me for the glory of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Bless the connection. Thank you, Son of God. We love you, Lord Jesus. Father, we love you. And Father, I have prayer requests that were asked of me. Father, I know, I know my unworthiness. Give me the grace to walk worthy of your Son, the Lord Jesus, to obey him, to love him more, and to die to my flesh. But Father, please, in Jesus' name, we pray for these two individuals. Anyone who's sick here, Father, physically sick, you know who they are. Touch them with your loving, compassionate touch. Cleanse them in the blood of Jesus because by his wounds we are healed. Make us whole spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, and physically. Please, Father. And Father, I commit to you, Yonin, Tatu, Lord, Father, please, as we come in agreement for Yonin Tatu, in Jesus' name, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, he was hemorrhaging, and they're draining him. Grant him perfect health. Extend his earthly life and touch him. And use this to bring him and his household closer to Jesus Christ. And Father, also, also I pray for the patriarch of the Assyrian Church of the East, Mar Ade, who is here for surgery. Lord, he is your servant and one of the heads of the Church of the East, this Assyrian church, this glorious church that you preserved for nearly 2,000 years, who has given up many sons and daughters for the glory of Jesus, martyrs for the glory of Jesus. Heal this man and transform this church for the glory of Jesus and use this healing to bring my people closer to Jesus, more in love with Jesus. Please, my God. We, the church, need you, Father. We need Jesus and we need your Holy Spirit. And, and Lord, Abba, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, the church of my ancestors needs you desperately. Scattered all over the world. Being persecuted from all sides. Even those of the household of God. Who, whether in their ignorance, condemned the church as a heretical church. Forgive them, Father, for that. Abandoned by their own brothers and sisters. Persecuted by pagans and Muslims. But you did not abandon this church, Abba. You did not abandon the church of my fathers. You have preserved it, and I know you'll continue to preserve it. So among them, raise up Assyrian lions and lionesses in love with Jesus. Please, Bobby. And Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, may I be used for the glory of Jesus by the power of the Spirit, not just to reach the world through social media, but use me, Bobby, to be a light to my own church, the church of my forefathers, the church of my mother and my father, the Assyrian Church of the East. May I be a light to that church because I am one of the sons of the Assyrian Church of the East. Please, Bobby, use me, Lord. Use me. Lord Jesus, use me. Holy Spirit, use me for your glory in Jesus' name. Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yahweh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' almighty name. Yahweh, Father, Son, Spirit, wash me down my table, King of Jesus Christ. In that okay, folks, I got a lot of articles to give you, and I want to welcome my sister Maureen Dahul. She's here. Folks, I don't know if you know this sister. There have been... Hunky, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. There have been few brothers and sisters that were there in my time of suffering. And this is one of them. Maureen Dahul, I want you to pray for my sister in the Lord Jesus Christ. Maureen, pray for sister Shami. Pray for their children. She's an Assyrian evangelist and a sister who loves Jesus. Maureen and her sister Shami, <clears throat> I consider my older sisters used to travel with me when I would go and evangelize. And Maureen was there prayerfully in my time of need. She's seen, she actually came to some of my court appearances. She was there. So she's been there. She can tell you how corrupt and filthy and evil the judge is, how evil and satanic the lawyers were. Few people were there by my side, and I want to mention them. Maureen, Shami, 
Pray for them. Pray for their children. Pray for Maureen's grandchildren. Uh, Amir and Samia. Don't forget Samia. And I ask, Father, you heal Samia and speak life into her in Jesus' name and destroy that cancer in Jesus' name. Samia, who has stage four cancer, and Amir, her brother, who put me up in their home. I know, and I'm not trying to appeal to sympathy and pity party, but because of a corrupt judge, I was thrown out of my home. For a while, I was living in my my friend's garage, Johnny Davis. Pray for him. Please remember Johnny Davis. He let me stay in his garage. He had converted his garage into an apartment. In that cold, bitter winter of Chicago, rent-free. And Amir and his sister, Samia, allowed me to stay in their home, rent-free. Pray for them. Pray, Lord Jesus, will heal her of her cancer. She's undergoing cancer treatment. Maureen was there. Shami was there. And also pray for my older brother who's now living with me. In Chicago, he took me in out of that garage, Salem, Shamoon, Sal. Asked Jesus to bless him, to give his life completely to Jesus and provide for him financially as he works all day. Please, these are some of the many people that were there for me in my time of need. And their reward is with Jesus Christ. And oh, yeah. Stephen Shaleda, I mentioned him earlier. Stephen is here, man. He's been watching me more than often. Stephen was there too. The brother was there and helped me financially. Stephen Shaleda, he's right there. There's many of them. I don't mean to not mention you. You know who you are and your orders with the Lord. This brother and his family were there for me. He helped me out financially in my time of need, invited me to, to his home, and his mother, Lord bless her, fed me. So pray for Steve, his two children, his wife, his parents, their family. No, Chicago is not for me anymore, Steve. May God put in your heart to come here. I'm praying that Jesus will bring my daughters to me. He will do something reckless so I can raise them, not abandon them. But I'm done with Chicago by the grace of Jesus Christ. Okay, with that said, are you ready for the articles? I have a lot of articles, a lot of meat for you guys. I published three posts today on Irenaeus and the church fathers. All right, but let me give you some articles, guys. Please, you have my permission to upload the articles, my YouTube sessions, to your channels. You can take clips of my sessions and translate them as long as you disseminate it freely for the glory of Jesus. This article is a multi-part response to Shibir Ali's written response to James White. You must read every part of my rebuttal. I just posted the link. Lord willing, I'll put it in the description box. Okay, there it's a multi-part response to Shabrali. It's filled with meat on the triunity of God, on the Lord Jesus Christ being the God-man, on the authority of the scriptures, the accuracy of the scriptures, the authenticity of scriptures, and quoting liberals to bury Shabrali and his lies for the glory of Jesus. So click on that, take that information, use it for the glory of Christ, and I'll put it in the description box. That's the first link. The second link, the second link, the second link, here it is, Lucan Christology, showing from the Gospel of Luke that Luke, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, affirms the pre-human existence of Jesus, that Jesus existed before he became man, and he existed in eternity as the Son of God. That's the second link. I'll get to translations in a minute. Here are the links that you really need to study. All of them you need to study, but these as well. I posted three posts on the early church father, particularly Irenaeus. Here they are. Save them. Here they are. Save them. Irenaeus and the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. I just posted this today. Must read. And I'll tell you why Irenaeus is important in a minute. Save that. I'm putting the links twice. The second article. The anti-Nicene witness to Jesus' deity. I quote a few church fathers before the Council of Nicaea, all of whom affirm Jesus is the eternal God, one with the Father and the Holy Spirit. So here's the second article. All right. Hopefully this slide will be also great in Jesus' name. Here's that second post that I published today on my blog on the church fathers. So this is the second post on the Church Fathers that I published on my blog. So altogether, I gave you four articles thus far, one of which is a multi-part series. 
The final one, folks, the final one, and this one I'm going to comment on. Irenaeus and John, disciple of the Lord. Now, I didn't write this out. I found this in a particular forum. A commenter wrote an excellent refutation. Here it is. Please, this last one save. A commenter wrote an excellent refutation to evangelical New Testament scholar Richard Balcom. Balcom, he wrote a book called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. Richard Balcom is of the opinion that the Apostle John did not write the gospel attributed to his name. It was John the Elder. Now, in saying that, he goes against the unanimous testimony of the early church. Now, here, this commenter went through Irenaeus, and he showed, contrary to Richard Balcom, Irenaeus says, the apostle John, not some elder named John, wrote the fourth gospel. And he quotes Irenaeus in context and does an excellent job of showing Richard Balcom is wrong. Irenaeus mentions it's the apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, the disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, the apostle John that wrote the fourth gospel. Okay? Now, let me talk about Irenaeus and correct myself. And glory to Jesus, he had me correct myself. Okay? Because I'm not an expert on the fathers. I've looked at certain citations from the fathers here and there, but I'm not an expert. So let me tell you why Irenaeus is important. Irenaeus was the bishop of the church in Lyons, France. In Lyons, France. He was martyred for his faith. I need you to listen now and don't let Satan distract you. May the Lord Jesus bring more for his glory. Ya Allah. Okay. Irenaeus was the bishop of the church at France and he was martyred, killed for his faith. He died boldly for the glory of Jesus Christ. Okay. Irenaeus is writing around 180 AD. He is the disciple of Polycarp. Polycarp was the disciple of the apostles, including John. Polycarp was the bishop, the bishop of the church, I believe, at Smyrna. Someone correct me real quickly. The bishop of Smyrna. And you know why Smyrna is important? Of the seven churches in the book of Revelation, only two, two churches were commended and praised by the Lord Jesus. Smyrna and Philadelphia. Of the seven churches, the Lord rebuked five of them for falling away and perverting themselves and threatened to punish them if they did not repent. But the two churches that the Lord blessed, Smyrna and Philadelphia. And guess who the bishop of Smyrna was? Polycarp. That's why some Christians believe that John, when he's writing to the angel of the church at Smyrna, that angel is a human angel, and he's writing to Polycarp. Did you know that? Are you with me there? Yeah, Arthur, I'll unpack who the angels of the seven churches are in a future session. Because the angels that he's writing to are not spirit angels. They are the human messengers. The human Because angel means messenger assigned to each church. And so many Christians think that when the Lord Jesus had him write to the angel, meaning the human messenger assigned to the church, the Lord is having him write to Polycarp, who would have been the bishop of Smyrna at that time. Okay? So who is Irenaeus? Follow with me. Irenaeus is the disciple of Polycarp, who is an eyewitness disciple of the apostles, including John. Now, in previous years, I had mistakenly assumed, this is where I'm going to correct myself because now I reread the citation and I misunderstood the citation. What's been my prayer, folks? That any time I'm in error, the Holy Spirit will show me my error and correct me, not to repeat it because I don't want to mislead anyone. I want to make sure I'm factually sound and I trusted the Spirit to show me my error, correct them so I don't mislead you and not repeat them. Because we want to speak the truth and live the truth for the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, I had assumed that Irenaeus said that when he was young, he had seen John the Apostle. I misread it. What Irenaeus was saying is when he was young, he had seen Polycarp because he was a disciple of Polycarp. I misread that to assume that 
Irenaeus was saying that when he was young, John was still around. So let me now read it in context. It's in that last link that I gave you. Here it is. Let me read it in context, okay? Glory to Jesus who guides us into all truth, corrects us so we don't repeat our mistakes, and transforms us so we don't sin but glorify him. Now watch here. Let me find it. Let me get the quote for you. All right. Let me get it, guys. I have to find it. It's right here somewhere. Uh, give me a second. I should have had it when uh, I was there. Yeah, and I actually saw. Okay, but uh, and I actually saw him when he came. When he came. Saw. Let me get it. One, okay, why can't I find it now? Isn't that amazing? Now when I want to see it, I can't find it. Oh, my goodness. Why can't I find it? Oh, man. See, guys, I was just reading it, and I can't find it. Okay, let me go through this slowly. Just as the elders saw who saw John. Okay. All right, for many, okay. And he remained until John. Some of them were so not only John, but other apostles. Sorry, guys, this is what happened. Yeah, it's right here then. It's this one right here. Yep. Could be this one, right? Oh, here it goes. I found it. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 3, Chapter 3, Paragraph 4. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 3, Chapter 3, Paragraph 4. Here's what I misread. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for correcting me. Forgive me for making a mistake. I pray people hear and not follow my errors in Jesus' name. Okay, here it goes. But Polycarp was also was not only instructed by apostles and conversed with many who had seen Christ. This is Irenaeus. Polycarp also was not only instructed by apostles and conversed with many who had seen Christ. He had met the eyewitnesses of Jesus and were, was taught by them. But was also, by apostles in Asia, appointed bishop of the church in Smyrna. The apostles appointed him the bishop. Are you hearing this? Polycarp met the apostles and those who saw Jesus, was taught by them, and they made him the bishop. And Irenaeus is his disciple. You see this chain that we have? Okay. Appointed bishop of the church in Smyrna, whom I also saw. This is where I misread him. Whom I also saw in my early youth, for he tarried a very long time, and when a very old man, gloriously and most nobly, Suffer, suffering martyrdom, departed this life, having always taught the things we had, which he had learned from the apostles and which the church has handed down and which alone are true. Did you see? I saw him when I was a youth. So even though I misunderstood the citation, right? I thought he meant that when he was a youth, he saw the apostle John. Clearly, notice what Irenaeus is telling you. Irenaeus is saying, I saw Polycarp when I was a youth and followed him when I was a youth when he was the bishop of Smyrna because he remained there for a long time and was martyred for the glory of Jesus and passed down what Polycarp learned directly from the apostles and eyewitnesses such as John who made him the bishop. You don't get more historical than that. The apostles like John taught Polycarp and appoint him to be the Bishop of Smyrna. And one of Polycarp's disciples is Irenaeus, who also becomes a bishop in the church at France. And like Polycarp, he's killed for Jesus, and he writes books that are still preserved. Sinking in? That's how solid the historical, archaeological... <clears throat> evidence for your faith is the christian faith has overwhelming historical archaeological textual proofs so if you after hearing all these facts turn away from the lord your judgment is deserved because he's left you with no excuse to deny the bible is historically accurate preserved the inspired word of god and the jesus of the bible is the jesus of history who died and rose again and forever lives. We have no excuse. And by the way, for the for some of you, we're about to begin. Some of you that were in 
the session with David Wood and I and the young man. What an amazing session. I was blessed. That young man, Ayman, that 19-year-old, very well read and educated, had very good questions. And glory to the triune God. Glory to the Lord Jesus, the Father, Son. We are able to give him solid answers that quenched his, his thirst for answers. So glory to God. What an amazing session. And notice he asked about variant readings. He asked about the transmission of the Bible. He asked about the Trinity. He asked all the good questions that people ask about when it comes to trusting the Bible, the preservation of the Bible, the very readings of the Bible, and what the Bible teaches about the God and salvation. Right there, he asked all the questions that you're going to be asked and why you need to be studied for the glory of the Chine God. So with that said, are we ready to talk about this topic? Are we ready? Let me give you the article that we're going to be using for this session. Okay. Part two of Old Testament Divine Messiah and Bible versions. What's my aim in these series? The Lord willing, I'll finish all the series if the Lord Jesus wants me to finish by the power of the Holy Spirit until he takes me home until he returns. We'll get to all the series in time. In this particular series, I'm going to provide irrefutable proof. Listen to me. Irrefutable, meaning you cannot refute these facts if you're going to be honest to the context of the Old Testament. Yes, you can come up with any answer to explain the way, but that means you're dishonest, you're deceitful, and you're a tool of the devil if you do so. I will provide irrefutable proof from the Hebrew Bible that the coming one is God Almighty, the God of Israel in the flesh, that God would enter into flesh become a physical descendant of David in order to fulfill the promises given to the patriarchs and David so that the Messiah to come is God in the flesh. One person, two natures. And I'll use the Hebrew Bible to prove it. Now invite more folks so we can make this go viral. Pray. The Holy Spirit will bless us to understand and let's focus. But again, because it's a live stream, things happen. And because things happen, I got to walk away for a second. Just don't leave. Razzle dazzle. I don't know, but I've been told Igloos are very cold Red light, red light hey. I don't know, but it's been said David would have wanted me Red light, red light I don't know, but I've been told David's heart is very cold Left, right, left, right Sailing along. I don't know what I've been saying. David was one day. Lift right, lift right, lift right. name may strengthen my voice and keep me healthy to serve the Lord until he takes me home in Jesus name and I pray I won't be a stumbling block to my neighbors okay are we ready now okay why did I include Bible versions for the second part Lord willing in the third part I'll drop that title because translations and versions are important God in his infinite wisdom has allowed these variant readings to arise because through these very readings, he will sharpen the church. Let me repeat it again. These very readings have been allowed by the triune God. Because he's going to use these very readings to force us to plunge the depth of the manuscript tradition. To study the manuscript tradition so we can know for certainty God's original words are preserved. And also use these very readings to sharpen us and perfect us and challenge us. All right? 
Do you see the wisdom in that? Right? Mustafa, stop it, dude. I'm going to block you. Don't start your nonsense here. I have a topic. If you're going to act silly, I will block you and send you to Mecca to smooch the black stone. So you can listen if you want, or you can be blocked. Okay? Now, everyone, are you following with me? Let me repeat. Let me repeat. Are you ready? Let me repeat one more time. Help me to help you. Make sure you're getting it. God in his providential preservation has permitted the variant readings of the extent manuscripts of the biblical books. Why? Because let, you, let, let me explain the wisdom of God in doing that. That then forces the church to plunge the depth of the manuscript stream and tradition, to study the manuscripts meticulously, to discover the original inspired words because they're preserved. Secondly, the variant readings will be used by God to sharpen the church, to challenge the church, to stretch the church and perfect the church because these variant readings help us understand the scriptures much better. With me there? And believe it or not, the variant readings have caused me to fall more in love with the Bible, has strengthened my faith in the Bible, and strengthened my trust in the God of the Bible. Honestly, the, the manuscript stream and the variant readings has actually strengthened me in my faith that the Bible is preserved and it's God's word and the God of the Bible is real and faithful and worthy of our love and worship. Honestly, I'm not just saying that. Honestly. It, the manuscript stream is one of the many proofs that the God of the Bible is real and the Bible is his word, believe it or not. It blows me away. Right? So let's talk about that in the context of... Now, when I talk about the variant readings, I'm not speaking so much of modern versions. I'm not speaking so much about English versions that are based on the manuscript tradition. Because we have some English versions that are pathetically bad and some that are very good and some that are superb. You know, my conviction, and I'll share it again, my conviction. I have come to the point where I do believe the King James Bible happens to be God's perfect words in English. That's my conviction. I'm not going to debate you on it. I'm not going to fight you on it. Why? Because every position, any position has objections that it cannot thoroughly address. That's just the nature of thing. Why? Because no one person knows everything. No one in creation is omniscient. Nobody. So it is not possible for us to have all the answers to all the objections and all the questions. Only God is omniscient, and only God perfectly knows the past, the present, and the future. Because God's mind is infinite and perfect, he forgets nothing. Everything that's taking place, place, he perfectly knows, doesn't forget, and he sees reality as it is because his perception of reality is perfect and flawless. Right? Okay, now with that said, let me ex again explain to you how English translations will impact your view of specific passages and doctrines, not that a particular version will give you a different theology. Let me again repeat this so people don't take my words out of context. Any major English translation will be translating the same text over 90% of the time. That's why if you take your NIV and your King James, you will see that they agree over 90% of the time right? Over 90% of the time. So you're going to get the same core doctrines of the Christian faith reading the NIV that you do reading the Revised Standard Version that you do reading the King James Version. So I don't want to overblow it and make it, make it much worse than it really is. You take the NIV and the KJV and they're going to be translating and be in agreement over 90% of the time. So I don't want to blow it out of proportion, okay? 
I don't want to blow it out of proportion. Send Mustafa out of here, guys. This this wicked demon of the of the devil. Get the guy out of here, dude. We've answered numbers 23, 19, 5 million times, and this stone-licking pagan asked the same question. But I do want to tell you of something. In the 1950s, when the National Council of Churches came up with the Revised Standard Version, that sent an uproar among Christians. When the National Council of Churches came up with the Revised Standard Version in the 1950s, the churches were in uproar and protested against its publication. Do you know why? Let me, let me repeat. In the 1950s, the National Council of Churches published the Revised Standard Version, which caused an uproar among Bible-believing Christians. Bible-believing Christians were in an uproar, irate, because the way certain passages were translated. And I pray the Holy Spirit will strengthen my voice and make it pleasing to your ears so that you can learn and be challenged. Let's go to Isaiah 7.14 in the Revised Standard Version. First last, you're here, right? You can post verses now. You here? I thought he was here. Okay, can you give us Isaiah 7, 14 in the Revised Standard Version? Now watch what happens here, folks. In the 1950s when they came out, people who were weaned on the King James Version and were memorizing the King James Version and knew how these passages read in the King James Version were in an uproar. They were irate. Do you know why? Because of the way the Revised Standard Version translated passages such as the following. Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a young woman will, shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Did you catch it? One more time. Isaiah 7, 14. Revised Standard Version. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a young woman shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Compare it with the King James Version. Watch here, guys. I need your attention now so you can learn. Okay, pay attention. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. So Bible-believing Christians who are weaned on the King James, because up to that point, the King James was the chief translation People were reading the King James, memorizing the Bible from the King James, and knew how these passages read in the King James. When this came out, they were livid, irate, and uproar. And I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to guide me into truth and save me from all error and recall the facts correctly. Now, do you know why Isaiah 7.14 was translated as young woman? Do you know why? Because part of the committee of translators included a disbelieving Jewish scholar of the Old Testament. They enlisted an unbelieving Jewish scholar of the Hebrew Old Testament. And the Jews reject the translation virgin because they claim that the Hebrew word Alma doesn't mean virgin. So they went with that translation over against what had been the fixed rendering of Isaiah 7, 14, the virgin shall conceive. You catch it? Now, because of that, the Revised Standard Version didn't spread the way they wanted, wanted it to spread. The Revised Standard Version became suspect and didn't spread and didn't catch on because of this. But let me tell you how Satan works. Are you ready? Let me tell you how Satan works. When the first attempt doesn't work, he doesn't give up. Guys, pay attention. He doesn't give up. Get rid of Mustafa, this satanic bastard of Muhammad. Okay? He will keep trying and trying until he gets you to a point where you're so desensitized, you don't care anymore, and you accept it. 
That's what he did with homosexuality. That's what he did with transgenderism. That's what he's doing with pedophilia. Do you remember when Brokeback Mountain came out? People were scandalized. Where two married guys started lusting for each other. Now look at it. And that's what's happening with the Netflix film Cuties. The Netflix film Cuties. That's what Satan is doing. You throw out a film where you got prepubescent girls doing sexual gestures. It starts a scandal at first. But then over time, people become desensitized. And now it becomes part of life. That's his strategy. So yeah, people reacted against cuties. Not for long. Remember my words. Satan's strategy and pattern is throw something out there to get you to react and then pull back and then wait and give you enough time where you become so desensitized to it, now you accept it fully. Did you know that? You don't believe me? What was the reaction to Brokeback Mountain? A lot of hatred and, and opposition to it. Now look where we're at. Where are we at now? What we have now accepted as normal makes Brokeback, Brokeback Mountain pale by comparison. You get it now? And that's how Satan works. He won't give up. He'll throw it out there, get you to react, pull it back for a while, but then slowly start bringing it in through the back door, slowly but surely. And he simmers it just enough. You get desensitized, and now you're fully accepting of it to the point you got these fake, effeminate, satanic, Queers of the devil pretending to be shepherds of the flock, fully embracing homosexuality, transgenderism, and even abortion, claiming to be pastors of the church of Jesus Christ. You get it now? So it, it started an uproar in the 1950s. Now, why did I mention Brokeback Mountain, homosexuality, transgenderism, and now the film Cuties and where... Satan is guiding America and the world because of Isaiah 7.14. In, in 1950s, when the Revised Standard Version translated Ha'alma as young maiden, young woman, Christians were angry, irate, and protested. Now look what Satan did. Do me a favor. First last, post Isaiah 714 from the NET. We're now in the 21st century. 1950s have come and gone. NET, an evangelical Trinitarian translation done by evangelicals. Isaiah 714 in the NET. Watch here. Watch here, guys. Watch what happens. Isaiah 714. First last, are you there, brother? Or do I need to start posting? For this reason, the Lord himself will give you a con confirming sign. Look, this young woman is about to conceive and will give birth to a son. You, young woman, will name him Emmanuel. Where is the uproar? Where is the backlash? NET, Isaiah 714, evangelical translation. No unbelieving Jew in the committee that I'm aware of, and yet renders it, Similarly to the RSV. One more time, post it, brother. You can be a young woman and not a virgin. And you can be a virgin and not a young woman. The two are not necessarily synonymous. Here you go, guys. NET, read. For this reason, the Lord himself will give you a confirming sign. Look, this young woman is about to conceive and will give birth to a son. You young woman will name him Emmanuel. Where's the uproar? Where's the backlash, Christians? And why is an evangelical translation rendering it as this young woman? And then adding, excuse me, the word young woman a second time. 
Oh, but Catholics, do you guys want to get upset, Catholics? Catholics, you want to get angry? No, Stavros. A young woman is not necessarily a virgin. Do I have to teach you about the birds and the bees? Okay. Now, Catholics, are you ready to see what your Catholic bishops are doing to your Bibles too? Isaiah 7, 14, New American Bible, New American Bible Revised Edition. Isaiah 7, 14, New American Bible Revised Edition. Guys, focus, please. Don't be distracted. Catholics, here's your New American Bible. New American Bible Revised Edition. Therefore, the Lord, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The young woman. Pregnant and about to bear a son, shall name him Emmanuel. How many Catholics here? How many Catholics here? How many Catholics? Are you okay, Catholics, that your New American Bible, revised edition, says young woman? Now let's compare the Dewey Rhymes, the Dewey Rhymes. Translation from the Latin Vulgate. Dewey Rhymes. Dewey Rhymes. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin. Cab, don't start that, brother. Don't start what's the original church, because the Orthodox will say you're a liar, you're a heretic. And they'll say the Orthodox church. Don't start these stupid quarrels. I'm going to block you, Cab. I'm warning you. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name will be called Emmanuel. Folks, right under your noses. Right under your noses. Is that the saying? Bibles produced by people who profess to be Trinitarians, who love and worship the triune God, who believe the Bible is God's word, whether evangelicals, Catholics, are now... Translating the ver verses the way the liberals were in the 20th century. And no one is saying a word. Mustafa, I have a question. Does your Allah have balls that Muhammad sucked? Because I know your Allah breathes his spirit into vaginas, 6612. And also, he likes women who are big-breasted like your mother. And he likes to turn them into whores like your mother. Okay, you guys with me there? Are you guys with me there? They don't know who they're dealing with. They don't know I'm going to insult Muhammad, who sucked Allah's balls. Because the black stone is Muhammad, it's Allah's testicle on earth. See, when Muhammad used to smooch and lick the black stone, he thought it was Allah's testicle, one of his nuts on earth. They don't know who they're playing with. They don't know me too well. I'm no evangelifish. I am no sissified Christian pretending to be humble and spiritual. Okay, this one talk like that. No, 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 no. Anyway, for the rest of you, focusing in Jesus' name. Well, it's big enough to be both, Rusty. Right? Yeah, see, they, they're thinking. They're used to, guys. They're used to white Evangelifishes, fishes, and I'm not trying to attack my white brothers in Christ. I'm not trying to be racist here, right? But let's face it. What we see on TV is this, this Caucasian pastor dressed in a suit, and he's dapper and de debonair, and yes, they just love you, brother, Jesus. Unless you're an independent, 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 fundamental Baptist, King James only, then wow, they can be bold. Right? Yep, all the way. Okay, now with the rest of you, let's focus for the glory of the Chime God. You see what's happening, folks? The evangelicals and the Catholics today are sounding like and becoming the liberals of the 20th century. What the liberals were saying in the 20th century, evangelicals and Catholics are saying today. Even though evangelicals and Catholics claim to be Trinitarian and claim to believe in the Bible, they are now spewing the same arguments that the liberals of the 20th century were. Right? 
You see what's happening, folks? You see what's happening? So when I talk about versions, I'm talking about ancient versions of the Bible. The books of the Bible being translated into Greek or Latin or Syriac, Aramaic, Sahidic, Coptic, Armenian. I'm not necessarily talking about modern English versions produced by scholars who have been poisoned by liberal, critical, Christ-denying, anti-Christian assumptions and beliefs. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the ancient versions that, for the most part, were translated by solid Trinitarian Christians who loved Jesus, who believed the Bible was historically accurate, the perfect words of God, and would translate these words with reverence and care. Even though there were heretics among them that were per per perverting scripture, there were true believers exposing the heretics and making sure that accurate copies were being made. So when I talk about versions, I'm not necessarily talking about modern versions by translators who may even be atheists, some of whom are actually agnostic, who don't believe the Bible's inspired, don't believe that God inspires anyone, believe the Bible contains myths, errors, contradictions, and may even question the historical existence of some of these characters in the Bible, like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay? And with that said, let's go into the first line of evidence demonstrating that the Hebrew Bible testifies to a divine Messiah. The Hebrew Bible speaks of the coming one, the ruler of Israel who will save the world, not only as a physical human descendant of David, but as God Almighty in the flesh, the God of Israel becoming flesh, becoming a physical descendant of David. Are you ready now? Are we ready now? And make sure you save the links. Study these arguments. Everything I'm telling you will be in all these articles for the glory of the triune God. Let's go to Mark 12, 35, 37. For this session, we'll be using the New King James Version if possible, only because the English is easier for some of you. Sargun. If they blaspheme and insult, block. But if they're asking sincere questions, it's okay, Sargun. I know you're Jilu and you're hot-blooded, but take it easy. Mark 12, 35, 37. Because if Zena complains about you blocking, that means you're really getting out of hand. Because Zena M, no one more angrier than her, no one who's more bloodthirsty than her. And if she's telling you're blocking, man, you got issues, bro. <whistles> Mark 12, 35, 37. Then Jesus answered and said, while he taught in the temple, how is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, David himself calls him Lord. How is he then? His son. And the, the common people heard him gladly. Now let's unpack the meat of our Lord Jesus's argument. Are you ready for spiritual meat? Are you ready for me to unpack the point of our Lord Jesus? Okay. It was common knowledge back then and today that the son of David, oh, I'm sorry, the Messiah, the Messiah, Mashiach, Mashiach, Christos, right, was the son of David. Now, let me unpack what the Lord is trying to get the scribes and the scholars to see. It was common knowledge, even to this day, common knowledge, that Messiah would be a son of David. So then Jesus asks the question, look at the brilliance of our Lord. Look at the wisdom of our Lord, because he's truly God who possesses infinite wisdom. He says, okay, how is it you scribes say the Messiah is the son of David? All right, what's the problem? David by the Holy Spirit. Let's look at Mark 12, 36 again, because you're going to see the Trinity here. Let's go into meat now. You want meat. For David himself said, by the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. There's the Trinity right there. Number one, David spoke and wrote. 
He spoke the words of God and wrote the words of God. Notice he spoke the words, then he wrote them. So what he spoke were the words of the Holy Spirit. What he wrote were the words of the Holy Spirit. You seeing that? David said by the Holy Spirit. So number one, Jesus affirms the Holy Spirit spoke to David, revealed to David the future, revealed to David heavenly mysteries, revealed to David the depth, the deep things of God. It's number one. You caught it? And what did the Holy Spirit reveal to David? The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Holy Spirit revealed to David there is a divine person addressing another divine person. And one divine person, the Lord, says to another divine person, also Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So the Holy Spirit spoke to David and made David aware there are two divine persons sitting on the throne in heaven. Because if you sit at God's right hand, you're sitting on God's throne in heaven. You with me there? Let it sink in. I want you to get it, right? So now here's the question, folks. Mark 12, 37. Guys, don't go off topic. Focus. Help me to help you focus, please. Mark 12, 37. Here's the question he poses. Therefore, David himself calls him Lord. David himself calls him Lord. David calls Messiah Lord, right? How is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. What's Jesus' point? If Messiah is the human son of David, and that's all he is, he can't be David's Lord. Do you know why? Do you know why Messiah can't be David's Lord if all he is is his son? Come on, Tarun. Don't let me embarrass you and bury Tobia Singer. I'll destroy both of you if you're actually using his argument. It's a pathetic argument, and I'm going to embarrass you if you're actually agreeing with his argument. If not, sit tight. I'm going to decimate Tobia Singer, that filthy dog of the devil. Just be patient. I'm going to get there. Okay, what's his argument? Okay, then Tarun, be patient. I'm going to refute him. Just khalil abu Tarun. Allah, the snack bar. Be patient. I'm going to refute these dogs of the devil and muzzle them for the glory of Jesus. Just be patient. Patient. That's why I say don't. Just listen. Okay? And now, now the rest of you. Jesus' argument is this. If the Messiah is only a human son of David, he can't be his Lord. You know why? No son can be master over his, his father. Biblically, sons are subject to their fathers and must honor their fathers. No son can be master over his father. That's number one. Number two, the sons of David who th sat on David's throne did so on behalf of David in the place of David representing David. So they could never be greater than David because it's David's throne that they're inheriting on his behalf. Are you with me there? And I'm going to prove that to you from Scripture before I move on. I'm not going to move on until you get the point. Okay. None of the sons of David who sat on the throne of David could be greater than him. Why? Because the sons of David were inheriting David's throne. It was David's throne that they were inheriting. It's his throne that was being given to them, gifted to them. And they inherited on behalf of David in the place of David, representing David. So number one, it wasn't their throne. And number two, they sat on the throne to represent David. Why? Just are you kidding me when you ask me that question? You're kidding, right? Because I'm about to give up apologetics if that's a serious question. Just the promise of an everlasting kingdom was made to who? The promise of an everlasting kingdom was made to who? To who? Come on, help me out. Help just out. Because he's now silence. Silent. 
to David. God swore to David. 2 Samuel 7, 10 to 16. 1 Chronicles 17, 10 to 15. You can read to 14. Repeat it. Psalm 89, verses 19, all the way to 37. Repeat it over and over again. God swore to David, my kingdom on earth is your possession. My earthly kingdom I give to you. It's yours forever. My earthly throne is your throne forever. The Davidic covenant. Okay? It's not Solomon's throne. It's not Hezekiah's throne. It's the throne of David that they inherit on behalf of David in his place in order to keep God's promise <clears throat> from being broken so that God's promise to David continues indefinitely because it's an everlasting covenant, an unconditional covenant, right? Let me prove that to you from what Gabriel said to Mary about Jesus. Luke 1, 32 to 33. Luke 1, 32 to 33. What did Gabriel tell the Blessed Virgin about Jesus? Luke 1, 32 to 33. Nick, it's not, I don't want you to ask questions. I want questions related to the topic, but also patience because I'll get there. Luke 1, 32, 33. You'll learn a lot if you just be, I promise you. Luke 1, 32, 33. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Whose throne? David's throne. And he, the, the son of God, Jesus, will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Whose throne? The throne of his father, David. It's David's throne that Jesus inherits as a son of David. Boaz was from the tribe of Judah. He was a son of Judah. Yes, Akinem. Stop asking me that silly question, please. And then Michelle mentioned Isaiah 9-7. Let's go to Isaiah 9-7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David, the throne of David, and over his kingdom, David's kingdom, he will sit, the child born who is the mighty God, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forever, even from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Do you see? It's David's throne, David's kingdom. It's not Solomon's kingdom. It's not Hezekiah's kingdom. It's David's kingdom, David's throne, that a physical son of David would be given the grace to sit on, on behalf of David, in the place of David, representing David, to keep God's promise from being broken. Get Suleiman out of here, dude. Get out of here, dude, with your stupid questions, man. You're a joke. Get out of here. You make Muhammad look intelligent. You with me there? Making sense? So let's go to 1 Chronicles 28, verses 4 to 6. 1 Chronicles 28, verses 4 to 6. Let's unpack the meat of Scripture. 1 Chronicles 28, verses 4 to 6. Pay attention. No distractions, guys. However, the Lord God, David speaking. However, the Lord God of Israel chose me above all the house of my father to be king over Israel forever. Well, hold on, David. You're going to die. How are you going to be king forever? Guys, pay attention. God said you, David, will be king forever, but you'll die. This is how David reigns forever. He reigns forever through his descendants. Are you catching it? You are my king forever. But how will you rule forever? Through your physical descendants, your posterity will be ruling on your behalf. Right? Forever. For he has chosen Judah to be the ruler. And of the house of Judah, there's your answer, Akinmanin. And of the house of Judah, the house of my father. And among the sons of my father, he was pleased to make me king over all Israel. And of all my sons, for the Lord has given me many sons, he has chosen my son Solomon to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. Right? And then verse 6. 
I said to me, it is your son, Solomon, who shall build my house and my courts, for I've chosen him to be my son. I'll be his father. Everyone got it? Who owns the kingdom of God on earth? Who owns God's throne on earth? David. Who is to reign forever as king on earth? David. But David dies. Yes, that's why David's rule will continue in his posterity. Their rule is David's rule, an extension of his rule. So he's ruling through them. You're getting it or no? Are you getting it or no? I don't want to move on until it sinks in. Yep, a dynasty, Rusty. That's exactly what it is. Okay, 1 Chronicles 29, 23. 1 Chronicles 29, 23. What does it say about Solomon? No, it's not buffering here. 1 Chronicles 29, 23. Then Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord as king instead of who? Instead of David, his father. In other words, in the place of David, his father, and prospered in all Israel, obeyed him. One more time, brother. God bless you for the last one more time. Okay. Then Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord as king instead of David, his father, and prospered, and all Israel obeyed him. Everyone got it? Whose throne? David. Solomon sat on God's throne on earth. On behalf of who? David. Right? Okay. Let's go to 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 8. 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 8. Yep. He passed on the baton to his son. Blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you, setting on his throne to be king for the Lord your God, because your God has loved, has loved Israel to establish them forever before he made you king over them to do justice and righteousness. So now notice whose kingdom it is. You sat on God's throne on earth. Notice it's not Solomon's throne. It's not Solomon's kingdom. It's God's throne and David's throne. So God's throne on earth is David's throne. It's not the throne of Solomon. It's not the throne of Hezekiah. It's the throne of God on earth given to David. So it's called God's throne, David's throne, God's kingdom, David's kingdom. Second Chronicles 13, verse 8. Second Chronicles 13, verse 8. In a sense, it's Solomon's throne, but it's really God's throne gifted to David on earth, which his descendants would, would reign over in his place, extending his rule through them. And now you think to withstand the kingdom of the Lord, which is in the hand of the sons of David. So why is it in their hands? Because they're David's sons. So notice, if they were not the sons of David, the kingdom would not be in their hands. Notice it didn't say, because you're the sons of Solomon. And you are a great multitude, and with you are the gold calves, which Jeroboam made for you as gods. Notice it didn't say, because you're the sons of Solomon. It's because they are the sons of David. 2 Chronicles 21, verse 7. Rusty, which part of those passages wasn't clear? Don't ask me a question that the passage has already answered. 2 Chronicles 21, verse 7. Yet the Lord would not destroy the house of David. Why? God, why don't you wipe out David's posterity completely? Because of the covenant that he made with David, and since he had promised to give a lamp to him and to his sons forever. Did you catch it? God will not destroy David's house because of the covenant with David where he swore a light will always shine from the house of David through his sons. Don't call me sham unless you're trying to insult me. So now you appreciate Jesus' point, right? You understand Jesus' point? If the Messiah is merely a human son of David... He cannot be his Lord for two reasons. Number one, biblically, 
A son can never be master of his father. That would be an insult in the sight of God. And secondly, none of the human sons of David could be Lord over him because the throne that they sat on was his throne, his kingdom, and they're representing him. So now you understand the brilliance and the wisdom in Jesus' words, right? If Messiah is a son, how is Messiah his Lord? And they couldn't answer. You see now? They couldn't answer the question. Wait. David does call him Lord. Yeah. So if David calls Messiah Lord, and David says the Messiah is my Lord, how is he a son? You see? They couldn't answer him. So that means there's one of two answers. One of two answers. You got it now? There's one of two answers. Either Jesus is saying the Messiah is not a human son of David, or he's saying Messiah is more than a man. He's also the God of David who became flesh. Let me repeat the two answers because this is what we're going to spend the remainder of this session unpacking. Okay. The two answers are either Messiah is not the son of David, so you guys are wrong. Or he's saying Messiah is more than a man. He's the God of David who became man. So David's God became David's son by becoming human. But because he's God, he's still more than a man and greater than David. So he's the son of David and the son of God. And as a son of God, he's greater than David. Now, folks, guess what the liberals will tell you? Guess what the liberals will tell you? Are you ready? The liberals will tell you, because let me tell you what the liberals assume. Guys, I need you to pay attention because I'm teaching you how to refute liberals and anti-Trinitarians. Okay. The liberals will tell you that the Bible books written by different people will often contradict one another. So that Mark does not believe Jesus is the human son of David. Mark is actually of the view that Jesus is not the human son of David. That's why he puts those words in the mouth of Jesus. That's what they'll tell you. Because they don't think Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John are written by the people thus named. And they don't think they're consistent with one another. And they don't think they're inspired. Okay? That's what they'll tell you. But those who believe the Bible's God's perfect words... And all the authors were inspired to give us true history accurately, even if they summed it up. And they didn't contradict one another and didn't make stuff up. That's not an option for you and I. So how do I know? How do I know that Mark isn't denying that Messiah is a human son of David, but that Mark believes that Messiah, though he's a human son of David, he's more than a man. He's God in the flesh, the divine son of God. And therefore, he is David's Lord because he's the God of David who became a man, a physical son of David. How do I know that's what Mark believes? Are you ready now for the evidence? That Mark believes Jesus is the God man. God who became man, and as a man, he became a physical descendant of David. But as God, he's infinitely greater than David. And David knew that by revelation of the Holy Spirit. Mark 10, 46 to 48. No, Arthur. No. In Mark, Peter says that Jesus is the Christ of God. Mark 10, 46 to 48. Here's your answer. Now they came to Jericho. Now they came to Jericho as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, multitude blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out saying, Jesus, son of David, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. See, Bartimaeus said, Jesus is the son of David, and Jesus never rebuked him. He never said, 
Hey, don't call me the son of David. I am not the son of David. That's how I know Mark doesn't contradict Matthew, Luke, or John. That's how I know Mark believes Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, is a physical son of David. But more than that, he's the divine son of God. So you understand the dilemma that Jesus puts unbelievers in, even to this day. If the Messiah is only a human son of David, then David cannot call him Lord. But David did call him Lord because Holy Spirit revealed to David and made David aware that Messiah is more than your son. That Messiah is your Lord equal to the Father who sits in throne with the Father. And David, realizing that by the Holy Spirit, worships the Messiah as his divine Lord who became flesh. Then rewind, Jude, and listen from the beginning. Don't ask me when you come near the end, Jude, please. Go back and rewind it and listen from the beginning. You got it there? But folks, if you think that Messiah is only a man, Jesus just created the dilemma that if you're going to be consistent and agree with Jesus, you cannot get around. But guess what scholars tell you? Are you ready now to get more upset? Guess what scholars tell you? You guys ready? Why I encourage you, don't send your children to Bible college or seminary or Bible university. Don't do it anymore. What you do is you teach your children the core sound doctrines of the faith, present the historical, archaeological, scientific facts proving the Bible is God's word and God is real and Jesus is alive. Educate them what they're supposed to believe and how to respond to skeptics at home because God has given you the resources online for free. And then send them to college to get a secular education to have some secular field that they can use to take care of themselves and their family. But don't send them. I'm telling you, I don't want to get people upset. Trust me, don't send them to Bible college seminary or universities because they'll walk in full of faith and come out wishy-washy, effeminate, weak, timid Christians. I promise you. Right? Guess what scholars say? Guess what scholars say? You know what they say? You ready? David didn't write Psalm 110. Either it was written after the Jews returned from Babylon, and it was written about the coming king, or it was a court poet who was writing it about David, or David wrote it about Solomon. And let me shock you even worse. Let me see if I can find it. I think I can. Hmm. Let me see if I can find it. Hold on. Let me see. Let me prove my point. Guys, give me a second. Let me prove it. Here are the positions. And this is among conservative evangelical Christians who claim to believe the Bible's inspired narrative. They'll either believe David wrote it about Solomon or David wrote it for the court poet or court, court poet wrote it a court poet wrote it to be sung about david or it was written long after david about some unknown king okay let me prove it guys give me a second let me find the commentary let me prove it okay guys just wait for me let me see if i can find it Okay, let me upset you. Let me get you angry that Satan has infiltrated infiltrated the churches, academia, 
and using even people who profess to love the Lord, unbeknownst to them, to destroy faith. And they're thinking they're doing God a favor. Satan is a serpent. He's subtle. If you don't check, check him at the door, he'll come and spread like gangrene. Here you go, right here. Okay. This is produced by Zondervan. Zondervan is supposed to be a conservative evangelical publishing company. The NIV application commentary, Psalms volume two. And these are supposedly evangelical scholars, W. Dennis Tucker Jr. and Jamie A. Grant. You want to get upset? I bought this just to see what they'll say. Okay, here. I even underlined it. Watch here. Okay. Watch here. They're giving plausible authorship and dating. Okay. Here. Here it goes. Likely, page 591, likely the poet is a court priest or prophet and based on the remind, remainder of the psalm, the Lord mentioned in verse 1, A, refers to a king or political figure, particularly given the language and imagery employed throughout the remainder of the psalm. Did you see what they said? One more time. Likely, they're saying it's most likely a poet wrote Psalm 110 or a prophet wrote Psalm 110. And based on the remainder of the psalm, the Lord mentioned in verse 1A, it's not Messiah. The Lord mentioned in verse 1A refers to a king or political figure, particularly given the language and imagery employed throughout the remainder of the psalm. And folks, when I was at the Evangelical Theological and Philosophical Society meeting, there all the major Christian publishers are there. And I went through the commentaries. And the commentaries I looked at, conservatives, conservatives said either a poet wrote it or a prophet when the Jews returned from captivity about some king or David wrote it about Solomon or a poet wrote it about Solomon. From my recollection, I hope I'm not wrong, I don't remember finding any one of them saying David wrote it about the Messiah. I could be wrong. There you go. Folks, they're putting a weapon in the hands of Christophobes who hate Jesus. Anti-Trinitarians, anti-Christian like Tovia Singer. Tovia Singer, a filthy, wicked dog of the devil who says Psalm 110 is not written by David and it's not written about Messiah. All Tovia Singer needs to do is pick this up and say, even your scholars agree with me. Even your scholars agree with me. Are you not thankful, my Christian brothers and sisters? My Christian brothers and sisters. God is raising up, and I pray I'm one of them. I'm not trying to be arrogant. Solid Christians who love God's words, believe it's the perfect words of God, the Holy Bible, historically accurate, and take the interpretation of Jesus and his followers instead of the opinion of academia. Do you know why these scholars are adopting positions that about 100 years ago would have gotten them thrown out of the church, gotten them thrown out of the seminaries and universities 100 years ago when Christians were all solid? Do you know why they're adopting the positions today? It's because they want the love of academia. They want the praise of men. They're in bed with the world. And according to James 4, verse 4, Love for the world is hatred towards God, and it makes you a spiritual adulterer. A hundred years ago, before the rise of liberalism started spreading among conservative institutions, they would have been asked to step down or thrown out or repent. You are safer by keeping your children away from these scholars. Especially, sorry, I'm going to get my, myself in trouble. Stay away from Dallas Theological Seminary. They have professors there of the Old Testament. They'll make you sick. Telling you. 
If I find the other book written by one of their professors, what he says about the Old Testament, you will be livid and angry. And by the way, the NET, New English Translation, NET, some of the notes provided for the Old Testament are by Dallas Theological Professors. Okay, now with that said, if you take the position of the Lord Jesus Christ, who wrote Psalm 110? David. Who did he write it about? Jesus the Messiah. Does Peter agree? Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, 29 to 35. Acts 2, 29 to 35. Watch here. What about Peter? The rock that Jesus used to establish church in union with the other apostles. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit. This is, this is on the day of Pentecost, folks. Acts 2, 1 of 4. The Holy Spirit filled them with power. As he's filled and inspired by the Spirit, notice what he says. Guys, pay attention. Acts 2, 29 to 35. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David. That he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. There's that prophecy again. But pay attention what he does with Psalm 110. Right? Throne. Verse 31. He foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we're all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God. He sits now at God's right hand in heaven. Watch. And I've received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He poured out this which you now see and hear. 34. For David did not ascend into the heavens. But he says, David says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Till I make your enemies your footstool. Did you catch what Peter said? Filled with the Holy Spirit, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he says, David spoke of Jesus Christ resurrecting from the dead and spoke of Jesus Christ ascending to the heavens to sit at God's right hand and wrote about it. Diana, focus, please. Let's not talk about your priest. I just said no side talks, please. W what's immigration got to do? See, Diana, I'm stuck for the law. Oh, my goodness. So, Christians, will you believe Mark? Will you believe Jesus? Will you believe Luke? Will you believe Peter? Or your so-called Catholic bishops, evangelical scholars, who are a disgrace to the name of Jesus and his followers? What are you going to believe? Yep. Can you cite to me one of the early church fathers when mentioning Psalm 110 that denied David wrote it? Did Augustine say David didn't write it? And he didn't write it about Messiah? Did Justin Martyr? Did Tertullian? Did Irenaeus, who was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of the apostles like John? Any of them? We are living in a time where you have to be careful of your own leaders who, even unbeknownst to them, with good intentions, they may think they're doing God a service and they're being honest. They don't know they're being duped of the devil, used by the devil to destroy faith. Because after all, if someone claims to be conservative, believes the Bible, worships the triune God is telling you this, that's going to rock your foundation. Wow, but my bishop loves Jesus. He believes the Bible. This must be true if he's saying it because he wouldn't say it to destroy my faith. But that assumes that he, he's aware he's being deceived by the devil to destroy your faith. Right? As for me and my household, I will believe the Lord Jesus, his inspired apostles, and the inspired author of the New Testament, and the early church fathers who follow in their footsteps. Diana, it's because Satan is subtle. He's a serpent. He wants to infiltrate and destroy the church of Jesus Christ 
And Paul told us, be careful because even from your midst will arise those to mislead people and there'll be wolves in sheep's clothing. Acts 20, 27 to 32. Acts 20, I'm, yeah, 27 to 32. Here, let's read it. Acts 20, 27 to 32. Let's read it. Ex Nori, let me repeat what you said. Nori, God bless you. Nori Davis, let me quote. Very true. Bible college is where men of God go to be castrated by Satan. Spot on. The Lord bless you for those words. Acts 20, 27 and 32. P Paul speaking to the elders of the church in Ephesus. Paul speaking to the elders saying, God has entrusted to you the care of the church. And he warns them. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Now watch here. Read 29 to 32. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, meaning those claiming to be Christian from your midst. Speaking perverse things like these professors and your bishops to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember. Acts 20, 31, 32. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. The word that speaks about his grace. The word that makes his grace known. The word that tells you what God's grace is and the word that he gave you because of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Let me unpack Acts 20, 32 one more time. Acts 20, 32 one more time. Okay, I want you to catch it. So now, brethren, I commend you. I, I give you. I hand you over. I entrust to you. What? To God and to the word of his grace. What does that word do? God's word is able to build you up, spiritually strengthen you, make you unshakable. And it's God's word when you believe it and act upon it that gives you an inheritance, an everlasting inheritance among all those who are set apart, sanctified for Jesus. Now let me explain what the word of his grace means. It means... God's word that reveals to you what his grace is. God's word that explains what his grace is. God's word that manifests, makes known the favor of God that he's poured out on you. That favor which saves you, preserves you, changes you, and grants you immortality and an everlasting inheritance. And it's because of that grace that he gave you this word. Even his word is from grace. It's because of his grace he gave you this word that makes his grace known. And if you believe it and act upon it, it will build you up to spiritual maturity. It will secure you and make you unshakable if you believe it and act upon it. And that's why I entrust to you. No wonder these wolves want to destroy your confidence in that word. Because definitely the Bible is that word of grace preserved by God. So how does Satan destroy you? By making you doubt that word. Now, if a Muslim attacks it, you won't listen. But if someone claiming to be a Christian who loves the Trinity and loves the Bible, whom you look to as a spiritual guide, if he starts sounding like an unbeliever, like a Muslim, then that will put a dent in your faith because there's no way in your mind that this man can be deceiving me. He's my spiritual guide. And Paul says, no, he's not. He's a wolf in sheep's clothing. And even those who have been among you will come out of you to mislead people away from the truth. Be careful. Now, because Jesus is real, because Jesus is alive, because he's almighty, he will never fail his church and he will never fail to raise up men and women who love him, who are sold out for him, who believe his word and try to live it and won't pervert it and won't mislead you 
There'll always be those true Christians in every age because Jesus is alive and the Holy Spirit is almighty working in the earth to bring about the edification, the building up of the church and to raise up solid men and women for his glory. They will always be around in every age. Look for them and the Holy Spirit will bring you to them. Sinking in? Exactly, Kenneth. Kenneth Samuel, let me repeat. These modern-day theologians seem to have eaten of the forbidden fruit of the knowledge in the Bible college. Yep. Sinking in? I pray I'm one of them, which is why I'm here, and my channel is here, and you're here. Because, folks, can I ask you a question? Let me ask you a question. We're going to go to Psalm 110.3, and we'll wrap it up, and there'll be part three. Guys, let me ask you a question. So I want you to see how real God is. Let the Lord blow you away. Okay, watch. Listen to this. No high school education. I was thrown out of high school. I got a GED, which is a high school diploma equivalent. Never been to college. Never been to university. Never went to Bible college. Never went to seminary. Didn't have someone disciple me and take me under their wing. Reading these books. Books by liberals, by Muslims, and true Trinitarians. And I still stand before you, having no doubt the Bible is God's word, having no doubt that if Jesus said David wrote it, he wrote it. Who do you think preserved me, strengthened me, did not allow me to drink their Kool-Aid and to follow their footsteps? The triune God who lives. No high school diploma. No college. No university. No Bible college. No seminary. No pastor to disciple me. Reading these books and not believing what they say. When it contradicts the word of God, the Holy Bible, and the early church. I am a testimony that our God is real. He's almighty. And if he loves you and you yield to him, he will guide you in all truth and save you, even from those who pretend to be his servants. Let that encourage you. Let that encourage you. If someone with no high school diploma, no seminary, no Bible college, no university, no secular college, your God is real and alive to save you, and he'll bring you to the right teachers. And I pray God sanctifies my motive, not to do it to bring praise to myself, but to him, so you have no doubt he lives and he loves you. All right? Now let's end it with the final point, and I'm going to do part three sometime this week, God willing. All of this was necessary background information. You must rewatch all of these sessions, part two, part one, but all of it. Go back and watch my earliest sessions. Learn the material. Make it second nature by the grace of God. The Holy Spirit guide us into truth. Correct me when I'm mistaken and make me aware of my mistakes to correct them. Upload the YouTube videos. Make clips out of them. Translate them. Disseminate the articles. Do all of that for the glory of Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, the final point, and we're going to wrap things up. Right? Wrap things up. Psalm 110, verse 3, why ancient versions matter. Why ancient versions matter. Psalm 110, verse 3. This is going to be in my article, by the way. In my article. Okay. Watch here. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power, and the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning you have the dew of your youth. Now, folks, this is talking about David's Lord, Messiah, who sits at God's right hand. Did you know that this passage has even baffled scholars what it really means? Let's post it again. I want you to pay attention. As the Father perfects my sight physically, spiritually, and gives me the health I need to serve the Lord until it's my time to go home. Guys, pay attention. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power, in the beauties of your holiness. From the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. Can anyone make heads or tails out of this passage? 
Even scholars will tell you that this passage is vague and unclear, ambiguous in the Hebrew. You with me there? In the Hebrew. Let's see if you're paying attention. Now, this reading is based on the later copies of the Old Testament in Hebrew known as the Masoretic Text Tradition, the Masoretic Text Type, the Masoretic Textual Tradition, which is later after the time of Christ. However, the Greek version, the Septuagint, and the Latin reads differently. Can I show you how the Greek reads? Now, in the Greek version, it's Psalm 109, verse 3. In the Greek version, it's Psalm 109, verse 3. Can I show you how the Greek reads? It's in my article. Let me get it. Can you get it? First last. If not, I'll get it. The English translation of the Greek. With thee is dominion in the day of thy power, in the splendors of thy sense, saints, I have begotten thee from the womb before the morning. You see the difference? The Greek has God saying to the Messiah, I begot you from the womb, meaning from the dawn, before the day was created, before creation. You see the difference? The Greek version quotes a form of the Hebrew text where God is speaking to Messiah and saying, before the dawn, before the day was created, before I formed the earth, I had already begotten you. One more time. The Greek. The English translation of the Greek. With thee is dominion in the day of thy power and the splendors of thy saints. I have begotten thee from the womb before the morning. The Greek quote... Translating an older form of the Hebrew says that God is referring to the begetting of the Messiah before creation. Before the day was created, before the dawn of creation, I had already begotten you. In other words, Psalm 110.3 in the Greek testifies to David's Lord already existing before creation. Now, Catholics, guess how the Dewey Rames reads? By the way, first last, in the Dewey Rames, it's Psalm 39, verse 7. Can you quote it? Psalm 39, verse 7, the Dewey Rames. Guys, pay attention. And I'm going to read how Justin Martyr cites it. Psalm 39, verse 7. Dewey Rames. What? I'm sorry. Not. The, I'm sorry. Forgive me, brother. Forgive me, forgive me. I'm thinking of Psalm 40. Uh, yeah. The Dewey Rames, the translation of the Latin, it's Psalm 109, verse 3. Is that the Dewey Rames? Psalm 109, verse 3 of the Dewey Rames or the Dewey Rhymes. That's the Dewey Rames, right? You just quoted? The Dewey Rames is the English translation of the Latin Vulgate. Catholics, notice how the Latin Vulgates... Vulgate, I said Vulgate because there are various copies of the Latin, right? Renders Psalm 110.3. Here it is. Let me read it. With thee is the principality and the day of thy strength and the brightness of the saints. From the womb before the day star, I begot thee. From the womb before the day star, before the morning star was created, I had already begotten you. So guys, the Dewey Rains version, the English translation of the Latin Vulgate, and the English translation of the Septuagint, the Greek version, the Greek versions and the Latin versions agree that Psalm 110.3 originally read of God begetting the Messiah before creation so that David's Lord was already alive and existing before creation with God. That means the later Hebrew copies are a corruption. The later Hebrew copies, the reason why they're a big ambiguous and unclear, because it seems likely that the Jewish scribes didn't like how the Christians were using Psalm 1103 and they corrupted its original reading. But thank God for the ancient versions. Because of these ancient versions, 
We know what the ancient Hebrews said, and it's been preserved, nothing lost, as a testimony to God's faithfulness in preserving his Bible. You catch it? So though the later Jewish scribes may have changed the reading because they didn't like how Christians were citing it and using it, these ancient versions, because the Greek is based on an older Hebrew form of Psalm 1103. Dewey Rames is a translation of Latin Vulgate. The Latin Vulgate is the translation that Jerome produced in the 400s. And he produced it from Hebrew copies that he was reading from. So that means the Latin Vulgate is translating Hebrew copies of the Old Testament into Latin, Hebrew copies that are older than the 5th century. And that means Jerome's Hebrew copies read that I begot you before the day star. Amen, Rodrigo. May all the saints who are glorified in the presence of Jesus, these theological spiritual giants like Jerome, pray for us on earth that we walk in their steps and glorify Jesus in Jesus' name. Now, guys, in my article, and I have the links, do you want to know how Justin Martyr read it? You guys want me to read Justin Martyr for you? Justin Martyr, it's all in that article. Justin Martyr, a second century church apologist, debating Trifo the Jew. He's using the Old Testament to prove to Trifo Jesus is Messiah, and the Messiah is God in the flesh, according to the Old Testament. In other words, folks, I didn't invent these arguments from the Old Testament. These theological, spiritual giants of the faith, like Justin Martyr, were already quoting these Old Testament texts to the Jews in their debate with Jews, showing the Jews that your Hebrew Bible testifies Messiah is God Almighty in the flesh, and that Messiah is Jesus whom you crucified, but he's alive. Worship him. Okay, here it is. Here's the link. Let me read. This comes from chapter 32 of Justin Martyr's Dialogue with Trifo the Jew. Chapter 32. It's a long one, but I'm going to go to the relevant part. Here's what he quotes. You ready? All right. Let me find the particular section. The words then, guys pay attention. The words then which were spoken by David are the are these. The words then which were spoken by David are these. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule also in the midst of your enemies. With you shall be in the day the chief of your power and the beauties of your saints from the womb before the morning star have I begotten you. Two facts. Two facts. Notice Justin said David wrote it about Jesus the Messiah. Second fact. He reads Psalm 1103 as saying, from the womb before the morning star I have begotten you. So Justin Martyr, a second century church apologist who died as a martyr for Jesus, is saying David wrote it about the Messiah Jesus, and he quotes Psalm 1103 the way we find it in the Greek versions and the Latin versions, not the later Hebrew copies. Are you blown away or what? Morning star is the star you see when the dawn is about to appear. Have you ever looked at the dawn and you see that star shining? That's the morning star. What it's saying is before the earth was created and the constellations. Okay, now, let me read. He, that's not the only time he quotes it. He again quotes it in chapter 63. Chapter 63, it is proved that this God was incarnate. Did you catch it? The, the subheading tells you. In chapter 63... Justin's writing down how he proved to Trifo the Jew from the Hebrew Bible, quoting the Hebrew Bible, that God Almighty who appeared to the patriarchs becomes flesh, and that flesh is Jesus Christ. And he's proving it from the Hebrew Bible. So now notice, chapter 63, he quotes, and then what is said by David, and then what is said by David. 
in the splendor of your holiness have I begotten you from the womb before the morning star. Wait, Justin. You're telling this Jew, David wrote Psalm 110? Yes. And you're telling this Jew, David wrote about the Messiah being his Lord, begotten of the Father before creation? Yes. And then you're telling this Jew, Jesus fulfilled it? Yes. But Justin, modern scholars tell us we don't know who wrote Psalm 110. And it may not have been about Messiah, Justin Martyr. He's not the only one, folks. Clement of Alexandria. Clement Alexandria in his book, Exhortation to the Heathen, meaning the Gentiles. Chapter 1. Guys, read. Clement of Alexandria. Exhortation to the Heathen. It's all my article. You have then God's promise. You have his love. Become partaker of his grace. And do not suppose the song of salvation to be new as a vessel on a house is new. For, quote, before the morning star it was, and in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Did you catch it? He quotes Psalm 1103 saying, This word was begotten before the morning star, and he is the word that was with God before the beginning. You guys caught it or no? Now, his other citation, chapter 9 of Exhortation to the Heathen. Chapter 9. Awake, he says, you that sleepest and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. Christ, the Son of the Resurrection, he who was born before the morning star. A citation of Psalm 110.3. Clement's reading Psalm 110 to say, he, Jesus the Messiah, was born before the morning star, before creation. With his beams bestows life. Are you blown away or what? Is our God amazing or what? Here's the article. Guys, do you see why I sound like a broken record? I tire you out and I tire myself out. That's why you guys, if you love me for the sake of Jesus, cry out to the Lord. Lord, give him the health he needs. You are his health insurance. To do this work until it's time for him to go home. Bless his daughters with health. They'll outlive him if you tarry. Keep him holy, not to shame you or fail you, but to love you more and more and to be bold and uncompromising for the glory of Jesus and provide, Lord, for this ministry. You see why I sound like a broken record over and over again? Folks, you are so blessed to live in the day you live. God has flooded you with such rich spiritual blessings and resources to destroy any fear and doubt that you have the Bible is, word, is his word, historically accurate. The Jesus of the Bible is the one who walked this earth. He's alive. He is risen. Death is not the end. There is everlasting life because he lives forever. And we can trust him in his word. So now let me end it with icing on the cake. Let me check something. Take the stuff. Use it, man. It's free. I got. Listen, guys. God called me into full-time ministry in 1999. Ever since then, day in, day out from 1999, I have been researching. I have been studying, writing, synthesizing, and doing YouTube sessions since 1999. Okay? Part of my research means, because the Lord has provided through you, by such books, books, that in the hands of the uninitiated, untrained, will destroy his or her faith. Books that will cause you to doubt faith. Everyone has permission to tra translate all of my resources in any language for the glory of the Lord. Okay? Now, let me show you again why you can't trust a lot of these scholars. And look to the church fathers. They were not infallible, but they were more knowledgeable more holier, more spirit-filled, more sold out for Jesus than these modern cowards, these jokes who, who pass off as Christian scholars. And many of them knew the apostles and were taught directly by them. Let me show you something again. Let me show you something. I just want to check something real quickly. And I'm going to use Irenaeus to silence these Bible perverts. Okay. 
Irenaeus to silence these Bible perverts. Okay. Let me see something. I just want to find. Let me see. Uh... Before I move on, I have to look for the right translation to show you what a lot of these Bible perverts do. Okay. I'm going to quote because I see that I can only see one. Guys, just wait because there are so many versions. It's like it will take you an entire lifetime to memorize all these versions. So here, I found one here. Let me see what this is. The Lexham English Bible. The Lexham English Bible. Mark 1.1. 1, 1. Let me show you what it says. And then I'm going to show you some footnotes that are meant to destroy your faith. The Lexham English Bible, Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, do me a favor, first and last, close the New King James Version. Let's see if you're going to catch it. Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the Lexham English Bible, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Guys, pay attention. Watch here. That's the Lexham English Bible, but now watch the New King James Version. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Did anyone see the difference? Lexham English Bible, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Notice the New King James Version. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Dewey Rames. Can you post Dewey Rames? We're almost done. We're going to end it here. Dewey Rames. Who caught the difference? The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Who caught it? Anyone caught it? Here's the Lexham English Bible. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The words, the Son of God, are missing. Are missing. But guess what, folks? Even the modern Bible versions that have it have a note to trouble you. Let me show you. Let me show you the note to trouble you. Watch here. Okay, here's the link to the New Revised Standard Version. Here's the link to the New Revised Standard Version. Watch here, guys. Watch. Here's the link to the New Revised Standard Version. It says, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. In brackets, they have B. In brackets, they have B. Here's what their note B says. Here's what their note B says. Other ancient authorities lack the Son of God. So right there, they've created doubt. Wow. So there's ancient witnesses that don't have the word Son of God? So how do I know it should be there? These are the same translations that will get you to doubt the longer ending of Mark 16, verses 9 to 20. They'll tell you that the most ancient reliable manuscripts don't have Mark 16, 9 to 20, which is a lie from the pit of hell. Okay, now... I want you to save this link, and I'm going to make a post out of this. Save this link. This is Irenaeus. Let me remind you who Irenaeus is. Irenaeus is the disciple of Polycarp. Polycarp, the bishop of Smyrna, an eyewitness to the apostles, such as John, who met them, who learned from them, who made, them the, who made him the bishop, who died as a martyr. Irenaeus is his disciple, his follower. He died as a martyr. And that link, and that link, at the very end, at the very end, paragraph 5, I'm going to read it for you. He's writing around 180 AD. He has a copy of Mark, a copy of Mark, 180 AD, a copy he would have received from Polycarp. Remember, who's passing on these Bible manuscripts to him? Polycarp. Where's Polycarp getting it? From the apostles. Pay attention. Apostles are teaching Polycarp, and they make him bishop. As a bishop, he has copies of the books of the Bible that he teaches from, the members of his church. One of them is Irenaeus. They get copies, and they take those copies to where they're at. Pay attention. In Irenaeus's copy... Of Mark, let me read it. Wherefore also, Mark, the interpreter and follower of Peter, 
Thus, thus commence his gospel narrative. Mark begins his gospel. He's quoting the copy of Mark. He says, this is how Mark begins his gospel. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets. <whistles> Who got floored? I gave you the link. Go to the bottom, the last paragraph. Irenaeus, a disciple of Polycarp, the bishop of Smyrna, a disciple of the apostles like John, who received Bible manuscripts from them to teach his church, one of whom was Irenaeus, who then would make copies and take them with him to France. And he says, in his copy of Mark, Mark wrote, started his gospel by saying, the beginning of of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets. But let's read to the end. Let's read to the end. Behold, I send my messenger before your face, which shall prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make the paths straight before our God. Plainly does the commencement, the start of the gospel, quote the words of the holy prophets. At, at, point out him at once. And point out him at once, whom they confess as God and Lord. So he's saying, Mark quotes the Old Testament prophets who confess that Jesus is God and Lord. Him, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, but also made promise to him that he would send his messenger before his face who was John crying in the wilderness in the spirit and power of Elias. He now quotes Luke 1, 17. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight the paths before our God. For the prophets did not announce one and another God, but one and the same under various aspects, however many titles. For varied and rich in attribute is the Father, as I've already shown in the book preceding this. And I shall show the same truth from the prophets themselves in the further course of the work. Now watch this. In Irenaeus' copy of Mark, Mark 16, did this copy of Mark have verses 9 to 20? When Irenaeus read Mark, did his copy have Mark 16, verses 9 to 20? Watch. Also towards the conclusion of his gospel, at the end of his gospel, Mark says, So then, after the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sits at the right hand of God. Wow! He quotes Mark 16, verse 19. And Irenaeus says, Mark 16, verse 19 is what Jesus said. And that's how Mark concludes his gospel. Mark concludes his gospel by quoting the words of Jesus, Mark 16, verse 19. Guys, you understand what that means? Do you guys get it? A second century copy of Mark. Irenaeus is writing around 100 AD in France. He's got a copy of Mark. His Mark. Begins with the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the, in the prophets. His mark ends with Mark 16, verses 9 to 20. Statements, passages that modern scholars question and get you to doubt their authenticity. But hold on. If Irenaeus has a copy of Mark, and Irenaeus is a disciple of Polycarp, the bishop of Smyrna, and Polycarp is a disciple of the apostles, John, who taught him and appointed him. That means he would receive this copy from the copies of Polycarp, and Polycarp would have received them from the apostles. Don't you dare tell me that Mark did not write the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets. And don't you dare try to convince me, James White, Daniel Wallace, that Mark did not write Mark 16, verses 9 to 20. He wrote verses 9 to 20. He wrote them, not someone else, according to Arianus. And if he is wrong, you've destroyed the foundation of the church and the Bible.
Let me give you that link again. But now let me show you one more important nugget. One more important nugget. Are you ready? And we're done, guys. I hope you're not tired. One more important nugget. You see why Protestants, an exhortation to my Protestant brothers and sisters, you need to go back to the early centuries of the church and know what these church fathers taught, the disciples of the apostles, the disciples of the disciples of the apostles, and the people after them for the first 400 years. You need to go back because they will be the cure and the corrective to the poison and filth of modern scholarship. Okay, now, let me show you something else. Let's see if you catch it. Let me show you something else and see if you catch it. Let's end it. You ready? One final point. Let's see if you catch it. You ready? You ready, folks? And we're going to end it. We're going to look at Mark 1, 1 and 2, verse 2 in the New King James Version. Mark 1, verses 1 and 2 in the New King James Version. Watch here. Which agrees with the King James? As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face will prepare your way before you. Now, one more time. Verse 2. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Son of God. That was verse 1, but verse 2. One more time. Guys, please pay attention. You got to catch it. As it is written in the prophets, as it is written in the prophets, notice Mark here says, the prophets wrote, behold, I send my message before your face, will prepare your way before you. There he's quoting Malachi, verse three, he quotes Isaiah. But notice, New King James, in agreement with King James, with the majority of our Greek copies, says, as it is written in the prophets, let's look at the NIV, the NIV. Let's see if you catch the difference. And we got to end it. NIV. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet. Did you catch the difference? New King James. King James says, as it is written in the prophets, plural, because Mark quotes two prophets, Malachi and Isaiah. But NIV and other modern versions is, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, even though Malachi is quoted with Isaiah. But now watch. Does Irenaeus settle it for us? Yes, he does. Here you go. Let me read what he says. Wherefore also Mark, the interpreter and follower of Peter, does thus commence his gospel narrative the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets. As it is written in the prophets. Did you catch what Irenaeus told you? Notice the two important facts at the beginning of that paragraph. He says Mark was what? What was Mark? The interpreter and follow Peter. Number one. And Irenaeus says Mark followed Peter. He was Peter's disciple and he interpreted what Peter preached. So Irenaeus is telling you, Mark is writing down what Peter preached. So in Mark's gospel, you're getting Peter's gospel. Mark's gospel is the gospel that Peter preached, which Mark wrote down. And in his copy, Mark wrote, as it is written in the prophets. What a blessing that God has preserved the writings of these men like Irenaeus a disciple of Polycarp, a disciple of the apostles like John, who's reading a copy of Mark that he would, would have inherited from those who came before him like Polycarp. And in his copy, he says, Mark is writing down what he received from Peter because he followed Peter. And in his copy, Mark begins the gospel, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, in the prophets, not Isaiah the prophet, and his copy of Mark, he says, Mark wrote the longer ending, Mark 16, verses 9 to 20, because he quotes Mark 16, 19, and he says, Mark wrote that. 
thank you, Father, Son, and Spirit, for these faithful men, the disciples of the apostles and the disciples after them, whose writings you preserve to give us a window to know what the copies of the Bible look like so we can have certainty your word has been preserved and know what the original wording of the original autographs happened to be. Thank you, because the Bible is your word, perfectly preserved, and you are the God of the Bible, who is the God who lives, Father, Son, and Spirit, and we love you, Abba. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Keep us in love with you. Help us to become more like Jesus, to know your word more clearly and live it out more passionately. And give us the health we need to serve you until the Lord calls us, until he returns. Bless my children. Bring them to me, Lord. Lord, it's hard to be alone humanly. Your will be done in my life. Your will be done. I pray I live and I die glorifying you. And I pray that for all of us. Maranatha, Lord Jesus comes sooner than later. We love you, Father, Son, and Spirit, in Jesus' name. Lord bless you. Pray for the provision. Pray for my health, my daughter's health. Pray for our holiness. Hope you're blessed. You got a lot of meat from the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name.